So we can go now, right now. Okay, moment. Oh, shit, shit. Server, huh? Nobody says. One moment, please. Um. So, can we already start uh, presenting? Yes, Doctor, please start. Okay, thank you very much for inviting us to this lovely conference. Um, but today we want to share with you uh, our experiencing in uh, conducting a new and innovative intensive trauma treatment program for adolescents. We did our research while working at ACADA. ACARA is an institution for child and youth psychiatry in the north of the Netherlands, where both outpatient and inpatient treatment is offered for adolescents up to 23 years old um, and their system. We, at that time, worked in the clinic at the adolescent um, department. And later on, you will see a video of the location. Uh, while setting up an intensive trauma-focused treatment program for adolescents, we decided to also uh, do this research on its effectiveness. Well, let's start by introducing ourselves. Uh, next to me is Ietje van Pelt. Uh, she's a mental health care specialist, a cognitive behavioral therapist and trainer, EMDR Europe consultant and trainer and researcher at uh, PSISO Specialized Mental Health Care and Education. My name is Petra Fokkema. I'm working at Trivio Care as a mental health care specialist, cognitive behavioral therapist and trainer, EMDR consultant from EMDR Europe and researcher. Now let's start with a small um, video fragment. Um, we will show you a video of Rijnerwold. And Rijnerwold is a village that became world news in October 2019, when a policeman, uh, a whole police team, uh, team, discovered a father with five adult ch children in a remote farmhouse. The children were not registered, did not attend school, and had been living in total isolation in a locked room of the farm for years waiting for the end of time. It was son Israel, then 25 years old, who had fled from the farm shortly before and who in a completely confused state has had asked for help in a local cafe. Three children, Shin, Edinho and uh, Marian, had previously fled from the farm on their own. When the discovery of the family became world news two years ago, they decided to make a documentary about their lives. And the Dutch watched the broadcast with bated breath, in which the four oldest children tell about their past and their terrible memories of their father. We want to show you a short introduction of the documentary in which the anger, the fear, but also the love and the compassion are visible. Ook als we mee willen zeggen, zo het? Ja. Ja, je was wel gewoon echt bang. Want hij was ook fysiek agressief. Ja. Dan ging hij zo lang wurgen tot je dan bijna het gevoel had dat je doodging en dan niet hier los. Hij was de zus. Hij was de zus. Het beste is gewoon maar er helemaal niet over te praten en maar net te doen op school alsof Israël en de er helemaal niet zijn. Ja? Als jij dan de geest van je moeder belichaamde voor hem, behandelde hij jou dan ook anders? Ja, ja dan, dan zag hij uh, mij gewoon echt als, als zijn vrouw. Als je, als je met hem sliep en zo, was het gewoon hetzelfde. Ja. Seksuele handelingen? Um, ja, dan ging hij heel lang wurgen tot je dan bijna het gevoel had dat je doodging en dan liet hij los. Nee. 
moeder die zit gewoon op de stoel en die zit een soort van ook lachend bij. En dat, dat gaf voor mij ook wel echt duidelijk beeld weer van, nou ja, van je laat het toch met je kinderen gebeuren. Ieder kind mist op het met gewoon zijn ouder. Ik denk, dat zit er ook gewoon heel erg. Weet je, dan, je wil niet de vader in de gevangenis en je wil niet de moeder die overleden is. En weet je, dat, dat wil je niet. Well, these are uh, the children of Reinerwald and uh, they show us some PTSD uh, problems they have. When we speak of PTSD or trauma, um, then it's someone is being exposed to one or more traumatic events directly, so as a victim or a witness, or indirectly heard about, uh, hear about them from a close person, for example, and shows a minimum number of symptoms of four clusters. One, the first cluster is intrusive symptoms, such as flashbacks or nightmares. The second cluster is uh, persistent avoidance of memories, thoughts, feelings, people or places that uh, remind them of the traumatic event. Um, the third uh, cluster is negative changes in cognitions and mood, uh, such as exaggerated negative beliefs about oneself, others, or the world, or reduced interest in activities. The fourth cluster is an increased arousal and reactivity. Um, the symptoms are present longer than three months. So let's take a look at the typical reactions in this developmental stage of the adolescents. Uh, we see shame of their own vulnerability or dependency. And this is a developmental stage where the adolescent wants to be independent, wants to do things on their own, wants to make own choices. Um, we also see fear of being found different or abnorm uh, abnormal, like uh, being crazy, or um, we see also aggressive and destructive fantasies. Um, we see radical changes in the negative core beliefs, as Petra already uh, told us. We see the developmental of healthy, of risky uh, behavior, like uh, driving a car with, with no license or uh, passing the street without, uh, with the eyes closed, but also think about substance abuse, for example. We also see a reenactment in behavior. Uh, and the tendency to repeat. So uh, the trauma can go on and on and on because they will be re-victimized uh, um, again and again. Well, before we tell you more about our new and innovative intensive trauma um, treatment program for adolescents, we want to share some statements with you. Uh, to inventory your opinion on trauma treatment in adolescents. These statements can only be answered digitomously. So if the proposition is a fact, then raise your digital hand. And if it's a myth, you don't have to do anything. Just sit and relax. Sit and relax. We start with statement one. It is irresponsible to start trauma treatment for adolescents without a stabilization phase in which the adolescent learns emotion regulation skills. Well, we can't see you, uh, so it's a little bit difficult. Maybe you can uh, place the digital hand, or no, into the chat so we can see the reactions. Yeah. Let's take a look at the chat. Um, we don't see anything. Maybe you need a little bit time. No, we see no reactions. Maybe we just can continue. Yes, we'll and, go um, on. We will go on. Yes. Okay, as you can see on this slide, uh, there's already a, a substantial body of experience, scientific evidence for the earliest possible deployment of trauma-focused treatment. And in any case, the severity or complexity of these symptoms do not seem to be valid arguments for offering patients a course of stabilization. Uh, 
are denying them treatment according to the multidisciplinary guideline for anxiety disorders. And you need to offer trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy of, or EMDR therapy. Let's go to position two. Yes. A small reminder, uh, well, maybe <laughs> yes. raise hands yes. into the chat if you want to react and otherwise you don't have to do anything. Well, trauma treatment for adolescents should be offered in doses, meaning at a maximum frequency of one therapy session per week. That's the, the standard, the regular situation, one session EM, uh, trauma therapy per week. Um, what do you think about this statement? We don't see any hands, so maybe we just continue. Yes, and we'll everybody continue. can do it in, yes. in their uh, heads. No, uh, is it a fact or a myth? And to those or not, and there has been a research body of research into the intensive uh, ver variants of uh, um, research with adults. Ehlers and colleagues published an article in 2014 following their research into an intensified form of trauma-focused treatment in adults with chronic PTSD. Um, they had a large number of participants. Um, here you can see the bl blue line. Uh, the blue line was the cognitive therapy for PTSD, an intensive daily uh, um, uh, trauma focused treatment, seven days in a row. Uh, the red line means the cognitive therapy for PTSD standard weekly uh, uh, during, uh, of, with a duration of three months. Mm -hmm. The green line is the emotional focused supportive therapy um, offered weekly. Uh, for three months in a row. And the purple line is the waiting list uh, where uh, the participants uh, were waiting for two weeks. Um, if we look at the effects and uh, the recovery from the uh, PTSD, the blue line shows 73%, the red line shows 77%, the green line shows 43% and the purple line uh, shows 7%. So in summary, research suggests faster symptom reduction while being compared to the traditional treatment approach. Also, there was no higher dropout or worsening of symptoms. So more recent, uh, Woudenberg and colleagues in uh, 2018 uh, did uh, great research in the Netherlands at the Sidetrack uh, Clinic. Um, and they have been developing a program for adults, uh, for, uh, for adults wherein they combine several evidence-based treatment therapies. And that means prolonged exposure uh, in combination with EMDR therapy and physical activities um, with psychoeducation. And um, their research shows that it's uh, a safe program, well tolerated, effective, and shows a high level of patient retention. Yes. So let's continue. Well, Mavison and colleagues offered an intensive trauma treatment uh, program for families. Also two sessions per day, four days in a week for uh, the du duration of six weeks. Um, there were uh, included ex uh, nine parents and 10 children, and they stated that a therapy program for parents and children consisted of uh, two sessions uh, of 60 to 75 of uh, yes, yeah, 75 minutes per day, four days a week, um, was conducted by multiple therapists. And uh, between sessions, uh, family members were supported by the carer who encouraged them to be physically active. Uh, and as you can see, after two weeks, 90% of the children and parents no longer um, had the diagnosis PTSD. There was no dropout and there was a significant reduction in psychopathology and the results also maintained after six months. So very promising results. It was a small amount of participants, but very promising. Yes. 
So Hendrix um, also did research, uh, very nice research of the Netherlands uh, in 2017. Uh, they offered an intensive prolonged exposure therapy program for adolescents. Um, the participants were 10 adolescents with severe PTSD and comorbid disorders after multiple interpersonal trauma. Uh, they showed no dropouts, and 40% of the adolescents reached diagnostic remission of their PTSD symptoms from baseline to post-treatment, and 80% even from baseline to follow up at three and six months. So the results even maintained in growth after uh, uh, the treatment. Yes. So what we can say is that intensifying trauma-focused treatment may lead to better treatment adherence, possible because there are fewer interfering variables that may play a role, such as reduced time between uh, therapy sessions to build up anticipatory uh, anxiety. Um, so it's a nice uh, outcome. So let's take a look at position three. Again, if you want to show your face and raise a physical hand, or you want to show a digital hand in the chat, you are very invited to do that. In position three, it is best to use different trauma-focused methods within the trauma treatment, meaning to combine different trauma therapies. Is it a fact or a myth? Well, uh, in an exploratory uh, study of uh, Van Minnen et al. in 2020, uh, they examined that P prolonged exposure therapy and EMDR therapy can be successfully combined and that the sequence of offering the therapy matters. Uh, the results show that the patients who receive prolonged exposure uh, therapy first and EMDR uh, therapy second showed a significantly higher reduction in PTSD symptoms compared to patients in the EMDR first uh, condition. Uh, moreover, patients preferred this PE first EMDR second condition and valued the treatment sessions as significantly more helpful in this condition. So they prefer this uh, combination, uh, prolonged exposure first EMDR second. The question is whether a combination of two first choice guideline treatments for PTSD, prolonged exposure and EMDR therapy, leads to a better treatment outcome regarding PTSD and comorbid symptoms than a non-combined trauma-focused uh, therapy. Because these therapies seem to be based on different working mechanisms, it is conceivable that prolonged exposure is better for some patients and EMDR for others. As far as we know, however, it is not yet known which trauma-focused treatment can best be used for which specific symptoms. By combining these two therapies, we expect an increased value on the therapy effect. But further research yeah, is it's very welcome. Yes, it's necessary. It's necessary. Yes. So let's take a look at the adolescence, uh, adolescence uh, perspective of the combination of therapies. And we asked the, our adole adolescents in our study to how do you think about the combination? So some said uh, uh, prolonged exposure made, made me see all the details. And with EMDR, that became more and more difficult. Um, most of them say that the combination was good for them. And uh, through prolonged exposure, they learned to talk about the shitty side and uh, the hard side of it. And they couldn't do that at first. Uh, and, and one said it's a typical adolescent response. Uh, prolonged exposure is a special therapy, stupidly talking with someone who's trained for it. So um, more uh, than one, uh, participants stated that uh, by seeing uh, uh, by uh, the combination um, of that the combination worked very well for them and that uh, yeah, yeah that it provided more uh, really? structure and yes. relief so yes that was their perspective so well we'll take you to the final position uh, and the, this position is about uh, 
in the context of CPTSD trauma-focused therapy, it is best provided by one therapist, so the adolescent regains confidence in adults. Is it a fact or a myth? Well, let's we'll tell you. Take a yes. <laughs> so the therapy expectation model, and maybe it's a, a relative uh, uh, new model for you. Um, it's uh, made by Van Minnen, uh, one of the Netherlands psychologists and researchers in 2018. And the therapist rotation is a novel approach for implementation of trauma-focused treatment in post-traumatic stress disorder. And results described in, in the article by Van Minen, written by Van Minen, suggest that the therapist rotation is an emerging approach in which a reduction in therapist fear can be, sh uh, can be shown. Therefore, the, the fear of applying trauma-focused treatment is uh, downsized. Uh, also, uh, the awareness of trauma-focused treatment and avoidance behavior is minimized. Um, which may lead to a better implementation of trauma-focused treatment. Also, the therapeutic alliance is assessed as good by the clients. Uh, also, also, when it was the case of an insecure, insecure attachment style. So the conclusion, it's, it is a promising emerging approach to improve the implementation of trauma-informed treatments. Well, then we asked the adolescents in our study, what is your perspective on therapist rotation? Because it's a new thing. They hadn't done it before. Uh, some uh, patients had about seven to 10 uh, different therapists, and they said it was fine. The advantage is that you do get confidence in people, and they also have different visions, look at something uh, differently, and that can give you a wider view. Uh, another one said, if you always have the same one, you get into each other's face too much. It's a typical developmental stage. Yes, response. yes, but we, yes. Can, we can understand yeah, we can this. Understand that. Um, actually, it was working together, the feeling of a team around me. That's uh, something they said a lot. That uh, was really striking. Eh? Yes. They uh, it felt was, a team, yes. uh, although... There were lots of therapists. Yeah, they saw yeah. a lot of uh, therapists, but they felt like a, a team around them. Uh, they also said everyone is different and that it has a different effect on me. Um, well, I can't read uh, the slides any longer, but there's someone, uh, one uh, client said, I didn't like it. Always someone, someone else is annoying um, and uh, she didn't prefer it, but what is very nice uh, that she had the largest decrease in PTSD symptoms in treatment of by all far, the, yes of far. all the clients. So she didn't like it, but it had a good effect on her. Yeah. So then we will give an introduction there um, of our research. Um, uh, when we look at um, the. Uh, the study results, we see a high dropout rate, and that has big consequences for the adolescents in this developmental stage. Uh, we already talked about re-victimization, uh, the fear of repeating and over and over again. So this is um, the stage to uh, offer an effective treatment. But when we do offer it, there's a high chance of dropout. So with the emerging evidence for intensifying treatment um, as seen in the field of adults and the study of Hendricks we already talk, uh, told you about for adolescents, we thought, okay, so these programs are very well to tolerated, they are safe, they are effective, and the patient retention uh, uh, there's a high level of patient retention. So the question arises. Uh, at our case, on whether this also can be apl uh, applicable for adolescents. Yeah. Yes, because we wanted to um, do something with a high dropout rate. And um, when there is dropout, a consequence is that a significant number of children and adolescents ultimately do not receive treatment they could benefit from. And we wanted to break through that yeah. with our um, so program. Yeah. So 
the purpose of, of our study was to determine whether this brief trauma-focused treatment program could also be effective uh, for adolescents with severe PTSD uh, following interpersonal trauma measured by using the golden standards for cl classifying PTSD in children and adolescents. Uh, we call that the cops Yes, and we predict, predicted that this treatment program for adolescents would be associated with a significant decrease uh, in PTSD symptoms, as well as a decrease in the number of adolescents fulfilling the diagnostic criteria of PTSD. Furthermore, we predicted um, a low dropout rate and that the treatment program would be safe, which means an absence of adverse events, such as no increase in suicidal ideation, no serious uh, self-injurious behavior, and no uh, crisis contacts. Yes. So let's take a look at uh, the background of this study we already told you about, but we wanted to show uh, this uh, brief photo of the uh, article of yes. Van Woudenberg, because it is very nice yes. to read it. So, well, the patients we included in the study received a trauma-focused treatment for the duration of two to four weeks. And in this period, 27 participants, most uh, female participants, uh, were referred by their general practitioners, um, uh, psychologists or psychiatrists from an outpatient service to uh, our intensive care department for trauma-related problems in the Netherlands. Of these patients, we consecutively included individuals fulfilling the following criteria. Uh, they uh, have been aged between 12 and 18 years. Uh, they were meeting the diagnostic criteria of PTSD according to the DSM-4 uh, and had received trauma-focused treatment in an outpatient setting, which was stopped prematurely due to severe dysregulation or trauma-focused uh, treatment had not been started because the risk of such adverse events uh, occurring was deemed too high by uh, the referring clinician. So and that was a very important point for us. Yes. In, uh, um, before you go to a clinic for an intensive program, um, the outpatient program has been offered already or, yeah. Yes. Okay. No. Now, we had a lot of uh, phases. The first was the preparatory phase, um, the phase in which we um, applied the orientation um, interviews. We did all the measurement um, instruments and we made a trauma sensitive case conceptualization. Um, we also offered psychoeducation to the caregivers, uh, to the parents, to the adolescents. Uh, to everyone who is important um, for uh, the patients. The processing phase was the ITT program, the intensive trauma treatment program in which the combination of prolonged exposure in the morning with exposure in vivo combined with exposure in vivo, um, followed by physical activities for 60 minutes therapy, 60 minutes physical activity in the group, um, followed by 60 minutes EMDR therapy, and again, again 50 of uh, 60 minutes physical activation in the group. Um, the last phase was the con consolidation phase in which the focus became on the transfer from everything you have learned, everything you have reached from the clinic to the home, the own environment. Yes. Well, if you have told you about this uh, daily program, you can see it on the slide. Um, uh, what's important to say is that in the at noon, the multidisciplinary uh, consultation took place uh, and their patients information about their trauma history and PTSD symptoms was used um, uh, for a case conceptualization and was used to uh, get all the therapists working with one client on the same track. Um, so everybody uh, was working in the same direction. Um, the therapists rotated between the individual uh, treatment sessions, which meant that patients had approximately, approximately uh, five to seven different therapists in a week. 
The therapists provided psychoeducation about PTSD before and during the treatment program. And uh, in addition to the daily uh, treatment schedule, the patients spent the remaining hours of the day either together with the rest of the patient group, for example, during meal times or leisure time, um, but also they could work on their school assignments or they could uh, receive visitors from their own network during the leisure time. Well, in the weekends, they went home and uh, further the treatment program did not contain any form of stabilization in that uh, prior to the processing of the traumatic memories, no relaxation or emotional regulation skills were trained. So let's take a look at uh, the clinic. So here you can see the beautiful grounds of the clinic where the young people stay during the treatment. You can see some of the attributes we used during the exposure in vivo, such as alcohol, tobacco, but also fake penises. Let's take a walk around the grounds. You can see the woods and also the hidden cottages behind the trees. And here you can see the practitioner who is specialized in boxing training. Uh, for young people. Hey, he explains the purpose of boxing. The first aim is to be able to unload, to get out of your head for a while and just enjoy boxing. The second aim is to increase the heart rate in order to continue processing. And the last goal is to experience strength, strength within your own body and to experience what you can do with your body in order to feel better and stronger mentally. And here you can see the EMDR therapy applied by the practitioner. Besides boxing, we also offer guided running, mountain biking, fitnessing, basketball. And here you can see the boxing. And all the activities are being offered in a group in order not to only activate them, but also to let them interact with other young people. And the so-called social context with is of great importance of this specific age group. So uh, in the last shot, you saw a beautiful house, beautiful cottage. Everybody has their own um, room in the cottage. And they can also invite friends, friends or family members. Everyone is welcomed uh, besides the hours where, uh, where they offer the, uh, therapy. So, yes. And each had told about uh, that there, uh, the activities were offered in a group. And that's all the activities besides uh, the individual therapy, prolonged exposure, EMDR therapy. Yes. Yes. Well, here you can see the comorbid disorders of the clients we included in our study. Um, the problems that occurred most frequently in addition to PTSD were mood disorders and developmental disabilities. Anxiety disorders and personality disorders also occurred. On average, the adoles adolescents in the study had 2.2 disorders next besides uh, PTSD. So PTSD and? Yes. Again, two comorbid problems yeah. at least, yes. Okay, now here you can see the traumatic events. Uh, domestic violence was uh, the biggest uh, percentage, uh, maltreatment, and also the sexual abuse. Yeah, yeah. and most of them in, in combination uh, of maltreatment with sexual abuse in Both. a home with domestic violence, yes. Well, the presence of a PTSD diagnosis and the level of severity of the PTSD symptoms were assessed using a clinician rated interview by independent assessors. The assessment was carried out prior to treatment, um, at the end of their treatment and at follow-up three months after treatment. So let's take a look at the total mean scores from the CAPSCA at pre-test, post-test, and at follow-up. Uh, um, uh, in the study, uh, we included 27, 27 patients. They had a mean age of 16.1 years. <coughs> Sorry, excuse me. The ma majority had a very high PTSD severity score measured by the CAPSCA, as you can see in the first, uh, the pre-test. 
um, with a total mean score of above the 80 uh, at post test. And all of the patients had been exposed to one or more interpersonal traumatic experience and, and the, displayed a high level of comorbidity as shown by Petra. Um, at the end of the treatments, uh, you see at the post-test, um, the scores were lowered, uh, even above, uh, how, how do you say it? It's even half. Half, half of, the, of the, the first score. Uh, yeah. Yes. Um, and you see at the follow-up, it continues. So it doesn't move, doesn't get better, but it also does not get any worse. So that's nice. The biggest um, promising effect for us, stunning, was that none of our patients dropped out during the treatment. So that was a big, big surplus value yes. of our intensive program. So the majority of these patients, and then we speak about 81.5%, showed a clinically meaningful response to treatment based upon the classification. And at the treatment, at the end of the treatment, 63% no longer fulfilled the diagnostic criteria of PTSD. No, very promising And there results. was no symptoms worsening. Uh, worsening. No. Yes, okay. Well, the results, uh, Ike told us, uh, there's a significant decrease in CAPSCA4 scores from before to after treatment. 81.5% um, had a clinically meaningful response. Um, and the average uh, admission time was 13 days of treatment. So 13 days uh, with weekends in between. 63% um, no longer met diagnostic criteria of PTSD. Uh, after treatment and the dropout was zero. The results maintained after three months of follow-up and no adverse events happened. So uh, we conclude that it's a safe and effective form of treatment for adolescents with very uh, severe PTSD and comorbidity after a series of chronic traumatic events. And again, small reminder, no <laughs> dropout. And that was very stunning so for us. Every client could get them. Yeah. So at least at, at last, we asked the clients to give you a message uh, to every uh, practitioner in the world. And what do you want to tell them about the program? So they said, there are a lot of messages, but we can make it smaller. So just do it. Uh, back to earth with an ITT in intensive trauma treatment and hand in hand we extinguish the trauma fire. ITT, we go to SAT minus three. Uh, in, in the trauma focused treatment, we uh, measure the uh, subjective unit of distress on a scale from zero to 10. And they said, go back to minus three. ITT is something uh, uh, so effective you don't often see. Now, that's a good idea. Start it right away. It's the only way. And this was really stunning for us because it is so hopeful. An ITT for anyone with a complex case. So thank you very much for your attention. Um, we would like to ask you if there are any questions. You can also send us an email. Yes, uh, of we, course. We showed it on our first slide. Uh, we could say, uh, put it in the chat also. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you very much for your attention. And um, well, maybe there are any yes, questions. Are there questions? Are there any questions? Thank you so much, doctors, for your.